welcome back. In the previous lecture, we met the momentum operator that forms a partnership with the position operator. In this lecture, we study the famous uncertainty relation for this pair of properties. Right, so let's think about having a distribution in x. So we have a wave function and we square that. And then we can calculate expectation value in x. We can calculate expectation value in x squared. And and higher powers of x if we like in the same for momentum and momentum squared. But how do how does this convert into a measure of precision or a measure of certainty, a measure of uncertainty about the value of x. Well, if we have a x and then the mean value of x, so if all the x values are very narrowly distributed around the mean value, uh, then the mean squared distance from the mean value will have itself an expectation value that is small. So we will use this mean squared error relative to the mean value of x to quantify uh, the uncertainty with which we know x. If we have a broadly distributed distribution, then this number will be large. If we have a narrow distribution, this number should be small. So this is what is called the variance of x and I will just write it like this. So, um, and the same for momentum. So we have the momentum variable, we subtract the mean value, then that gives us the deviation from the mean value. We square the deviation, we take the expectation value, and this will be the variance of p. Before proceeding, let me point out that the square is really important because if we don't square, then the expectation value of this quantity without squaring, that will just be zero because what is this? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a, a mean value of this difference. Well, that's just the difference of the mean value. So there's the mean value of x minus the mean value of the mean value of x, but that's the mean value of x itself because we are now averaging these numbers and so we just get zero. So we really need to square and have a, a mean squared distance to uh, a mean squared deviation from the mean value to have a reasonable measure of uncertainty. And so that's this variance. Now, in the example that we saw before, the expectation value of x and expectation value of p, they were both zero, so the variance of x and the variance of p was, was just equal to the expectation value of x squared and the expectation value of p squared. And we saw that these products uh, was equal to a certain number that was independent of uh, the width of the distribution that was characterized by kappa. Now that's a very special case. Now let's try to say something more general about this situation. And for that, I will follow a, a standard argument for this kind of situation. And that begins by taking x minus x mean value and p minus the mean value of p. And multiplying them by real constants a and b that I will choose later. And then I also multiply a minus i here. Yeah, or a plus i, it doesn't matter. And let me just write a minus i. So a and b are real, and we choose them later. And so this is now a new operator which is this linear combination of the position operator and the momentum operator and those numbers, expectation value of x, expectation value of p. And let's just give this a name. Let's call that c. Now c is not a, a emission operator. And we take the adjoint 
and then it will be plus IB, P minus P. And so this will be C adjoint. Now, the combination of C and C adjoint, that's a positive operator. So whenever we take the expectation value of that, we will get a number that is definitely not negative. And this is what we're going to exploit. Because if I look at the product of C and C adjoint, then what is that? Okay, first of all, I get this times this. So I get a squared and then x minus x at a mean value squared. I multiply this with this. And since there is a negative i here and a positive i here, they, they will cancel and I get b squared and then the square of p minus p squared. And so in this expectation value of c and c adjoint, well, we get the expectation value of this, that's the variance of x. We get the expectation value of this, that's the variance of p. Uh, that's already useful. But then there are more terms, and the, the other terms are the ones that we get by multiplying this x term with this p term. There's an a here and an ib, IB there, so it will be an i, a, b, and then x minus x adjoint. Um, x minus x expectation value, p minus p expectation value. And then we have another term where this p operator will be multiplied with this x operator. Well, that also has a factor of a and i and b, but it comes with a minus sign. And then we have these same factors, but in the reverse order. So, we look at the expectation value of C and C adjoint. It's A squared times the variance of X plus B squared, the variance of P, and then plus IAB, and then the expectation value of the XP product minus the PX product. So it's the expectation value of the commutator of x minus x expectation value p minus p expectation value. Now in this commutator, these numbers, mean value of x, mean value of p, don't matter because they, they give no contribution to a, to a commutator. So the value of this commutator is just the value of the commutator of x and p. Well, that's the Heisenberg commutator, which we know to be equal to ih bar. So, so this second term simplifies enormously because we get the expectation value of ih bar, and that's just ih bar itself. So what we find is that this expectation value of c and c adjoint is equal to a squared, the variance of x, plus b squared, the variance of p, plus ih bar times i, plus ihb times ih bar, minus h bar times ab, and all of that has to be positive, irrespective of the values that we choose for a and b as long as a and b are real. Why do they have to be real? Because when I go from c to the adjoint of c, I don't take the complex conjugate of a or the complex conjugate of b because these are real numbers. So, so that a and b are real is already built into what we are doing. Then, of course, I have to consider this for all possible choices for real a and real b. So, then what does, what does this tell us? So, we have this statement that a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of p 
minus h bar a b is larger, perhaps equal to zero, for all real values a and b. So we can choose a and b any way we like. They have to be, as long as they are real, this will be true. So let's uh, continue with this equation and complete a square. So I will write a square root variance of x minus b the square root of the variance of p and I'm squaring that and that will give me this term and this term by squaring these terms but there is another term here which is negative 2ab square root of the variance of x times the square root of the variance of p so I have to add this in to compensate for the cross term that I have in this square and then we have minus h bar a b larger than zero. So and now we choose a and b such that this square is zero. Why is that good? Because we are, uh, we are bounding zero from above and we get a tight bound if we make this square equal to zero because that will always be positive. So which making it zero makes it small. And so we make this equal to zero and we get this by choosing a equal to lambda times the square root of the variance of p and for b we choose the same lambda times the square root of the variance of x. So now the a times the square root of x will be lambda square root of the variance of x times the square root of the variance of p and the b square root of p will be the same value lambda square, square root of variance of x square root of variance of p. So with, with this choice for a and b this, this uh, square is always zero and the lambda is just any real number. And so now we also have the a and b here and the a and b here and so we get two times the square root of the variance of x, the variance of p, minus h bar, multiplied by a and b, a and b is lambda squared, and then the variance of x times the variance of p, uh, that's the product of a and b, a and b, a and b, that's a common factor, and all of this has to be positive. Now for all of this to be positive, we need this square root to be positive, it is by definition. The lambda square, the square is positive because it's the square of a real number, and so what is required and what must always be true is that this difference is positive. And this difference being positive means that the variance of x times the variance of p is always larger, perhaps equal, to h bar half squared. And this is a very famous uncertainty relation by, well, Heisenberg, but other people were involved, among them Kennard, Weil, and it's, most of the time it looks a little bit different when it is written because people like to use the square root of the variance of x and and write for this something like delta x and call it the uncertainty in x and for the square root of the variance of p one writes delta p and calls it the uncertainty in p and then uh, with these square roots you have delta x times delta p larger than half h bar but of course the statement is exactly the same okay. 
So um, in the example that we had before, we found that this product is half of h bar squared, which is indeed larger than a quarter of h bar squared. But that was a very special um, wave function for which we have a very particular psi, psi of x, a very particular psi of p, very particular values for the expectation values of, of x, x squared, p, and p squared. Whereas, whereas this is a general result, which is true whatever is the wave function uh, in x or the wave function in p. It is always true. And what it says is that if you have a situation such that the variance of x is very small, so you know the x value with great precision, meaning that when you make an x measurement, you can predict that x will be in a very narrow range. So you know uh, the value of x before the measurement with great precision and small uncertainty. Then you pay a price for that by having a um, uh, correspondingly large uncertainty in the momentum. Because if one of these numbers is very small, the other one has to be large to maintain the product above the threshold that is stated by the uncertainty relation. So it's not possible to have very precise knowledge about position and momentum in, in the way the system is prepared. If the system is prepared such that we have a small uncertainty in position, we, we have a correspondingly large uncertainty in the momentum. And vice versa, if we prepare the system such that the momentum is very well defined, very small uncertainty on the momentum, then uh, position measurement gives us values in a large range, which means that we can not predict anything about the outcome of a position measurement with, with great certainty. In summary, we demonstrated the uncertainty relation that bounds the product of the variance of the position and the variance of the momentum from below. This brings us to the end of this cycle of lectures. In the next cycle, we will talk about the time dependence of a particle moving along the line and also about other topics.